Right. You too. Okay. So welcome everybody. We are very happy to have Andrew Tolley from uh, Imperial College London, um, uh, who's going to tell us about effective field theories and positivity bounds. Now, before he starts, let me give you a brief introduction to Andrew. So Andrew did his uh, PhD in Cambridge University under Neil Turok, well, under the supervision of Neil Turok. Um, uh, he worked uh, in uh, cosmology, gravitational physics, and recently he has done some very impressive work in quantum effective field theories. Uh, he is one of the originators of a theory called ghost-free massive gravity. Um, and uh, so after he did his PhD, he uh, uh, was a visiting fellow at uh, Perimeter Institute. Um, and uh, then he was postdoc in, in Princeton University. Uh, and then uh, he has been at Imperial for the last few years. Uh, on a personal note, Andrew and I went to the same college. He was a year above me. But very surprisingly, I don't remember seeing him much in college. And he tells me that he never went to college. <laughs> went much into college. <laughs> Cambridge, situ Cambridge uh, thing is that you have your meals in college and the meals were not worth uh, having. Uh, so in fact, there was a massive protest, uh, um, I remember once. Uh, but anyhow, so I'm very pleased to have my friend telling us about effective field theories. OK, thank you. So I'm, uh, I'm going to overview sort of various, um, sort of, it's gonna be a lightning overview of various topics, but what I'm gonna to want to do is sort of explain pedagogically what the positivity bound store is about. Um, so hopefully you, you take that away at least. Um, it's something that uh, there's been quite a lot of progress on recently. I've been working on it for a few years. I'll explain a bit why you got into this, but um, there's been a lot of progress more recently. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry. Have trouble with my thing. There we go. Press the mouse. Um, so let us start off. So um, first off, what's an effective field theory? Just to remind you, um, most of the time in cosmology and particle physics and condensed matter physics, we're not dealing with some particular UV completion. We, you know, we're grateful if we know what that is, what the full theory is. Uh, but most of the time, we're working with just a low energy effective theory. Now we can formally define a low energy effective theory as let's suppose we did know what the full theory describing our dynamical system is valid at all energy scales. So uh, it may be, for example, just some uh, renormalizable the informal field theory, or it may be a string theory, uh, when whatever it is, um, the low energy effective theory, the idea is it's just supposed to describe the low energy part of the physics. Um, as best as it can without necessarily getting dwell, uh, uh, tied up in the high energy physics. So that the path integral level, we can regard this as what's going on is the low energy effective theory is defined as what you get if you took the full theory and you integrated out all the heavy physics, all the high energy physics. And that would give then a, a part of the path integral which you should then integrate over the light physics to get the final correlation functions and S matrix and so on. Uh, and that's usually what we think that effective action that we get here is naively is non-local if you do those integrals, but at low energies, it looks local because we can do all the non-locality comes in uh, from things like, you know, box over some mass scale, which are the mass scale is the masses of the heavy fields. And we can do, uh, as long as we work at energies below that mass scale, then we can expand all the non-local stuff. And then the low energy effective theory is just then a local uh, effective action. And that local effective action is enough to, to describe uh, essentially all low energy physics. Now, very often we don't actually know what the UV completion is, uh, and we are working in the opposite direction, which is that what we do is we write down some low energy effective action uh, following the principles of effective field theory, which is basically we write down every single local operator we can, which is consistent with the symmetries of the theory. Um, typically, we write it in a way to suppress, we assume there's some common scale, which is the cutoff of the effective theory. So it's the scale at which below that energy scale, we trust the effective theory. Once we get to that energy scale, something new physics comes in, whether it's um, a new particle or strong coupling or something like that, we don't, don't worry, we remain agnostic about it. Uh, and we'll just colloquially refer to that as the cutoff of the effective theory. So that's the scale. Uh, at which we no longer trust the low energy effective theory. Uh, so most of the time what we actually do, particularly in, in cosmology, where we, we, we're less clear on how to embed um, our cosmological theories in, in uh, string theory, for example, we're working 
uh, with the, the bottom-up approach for low-end effective theory. Now, in recent years, lots of people have been asking the question, um, are all low energy effective theories allowed? So if you take those principle and you just write down every single local operator allowed by the symmetries of your low energy theory, there's a big freedom there. Um, that freedom gets more and more as you go to higher order in, irre in the irrelevant operator expansion. Uh, the natural question is, you know, is everything okay? Um, and till relatively recently, most people would say, yes, you know, the, the all effective theories are okay it's as long as they, they satisfy reasonable uh, principles. Uh, however, in the last few years that situation has changed and people have argued that in fact that's not the case, that not all low energy effective theories are um, uh, okay uh, in the sense that they don't necessarily admit a UV completion that respects certain things we would like a UV completion to respect, specifically unitarity, causality, Lorentz invariance, etc, etc. Um, if we give up Lorentz invariance, and there's a lot of freedom, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, so th this very much, this perspective very much is wedded to your assumption about what the UV completion is. In particular, in the context of string theory, uh, you can ask that question, you know, uh, is the, does every low energy effective theory come from string theory? And this is usually sort of phrased in the, the swamp plan versus landscape terminology. Um, but what, what I'm going to say is not wedded to string theory per se, it's, it's wedded to more uh, traditional assumptions um, about what the UV completion is. So people have been talking about all sorts of things. You, you've probably heard about the swamp line conjectures, uh, zero thought of these are constraints on how far you can go in field space. These are very conjectural, and many of these are very conjectural. There are uh, weak gravity conjecture arguments. These are a little bit more solid. Um, there's been more justification for many of these. And then there's also considerations that come from causality. Some from a requiring, say, there's no um, time advances in scattering and so on. Um, and, but the one I shall focus on today, which I think are the most precise uh, uh, and most rigorous of all these different things we can drive are the so-called positivity bounds. And positivity bounds are, are um, the assumptions that uh, led to them, lead to them, are very much the same as used in the bootstrap S matrix bootstrap approach. And so there, this is more or less this, the same uh, topic, and it's just a much you use from the information from unitarity and the different approaches. Um, okay, so what do the positivity bounds actually do? I'm going to introduce them for a little while. In fact, the first half of the talk is just going to be reviewing where they come from. But the punchline is they put constraints on typically the signs and the magnitudes and uh, more generally the range of coefficients in, in the, of operators in a low-energy vector theory, so those sort of Wilson coefficients. And they're particularly powerful for theories um, which are naturally uh, non-renormalizable. In other words, effective field theories where, for example, you're describing physics in a broken state. So, for example, effective field theories for Goldstone modes when you have some symmetry breaking. Uh, and similarly, they're also very powerful for effective theories for higher spin particles for the same reason high spin particles. If you try and write down a local field theory, it's always non-renormalizable. So put strong constraints on that. Um, Okay, so let me get straight to the point then. So what, what are, where do the positivity bounds come from? Now, most of the calculation we'll see later is on, done on the level of the S matrix, but the idea can be understood without going all the way to the S matrix. The idea is there at something much more simple, which is in the two point function of a scalar field. So it's a textbook quantum field theory result that you may have done in your QFT class. Um, if not, it's certainly in Weinberg's a nice section that um, there's a classic result that you can, in a theory which is Lorentz invariant or Poincaré invariant, I should really say, if you look at the, uh, a scalar operator and that scalar may be fundamental or it may be composite, it doesn't matter. So it may be something like the trace of the stress energy, but just imagine some scalar operator, we'll call it O of X. Then we know that uh, the, the basic principle of relativistic locality or relativistic causality is that operators should commute outside of the light cone. Okay, so that's quantum mechanically to characterize that there's no propagation faster than the speed of light. Um, so th this is this statement here. 
And unitarity tells us that, well, if we took a real uh, field and we squared it, or we smoothed it in some way, and then we squared it, and we compute the expectation value of that, that should be positive, because the, in, the inner product in the Hilbert space is supposed to be positive if it's physical. So if we take the VEV of anything, which is a square, and that thing is real, we should get something positive. And a classic result is from those assumptions, together with Poincare, uh, Poincare invariants, you can derive uh, something which is called the channel layman spectral representation. And that's the statement that if you took the two-point function, uh, you can phrase it different ways, but I'll phrase it in terms of the time-ordered two-point function, so the analog of the interacting Feynman propagator. If you wrote that, that in momentous space, then the full interacting Feynman propagator, which includes all the loop contributions and perturbative ones, non-perturbative contributions, the full interacting propagator, whatever it is, if it respects locality, causality, Lorentz invariance, and unitarity, it has to be a, a superposition of free Feynman propagators with a weight associated with that. So by free Feynman propagators, I mean something that goes like k squared plus a mass squared, I'll call that mass squared square mu. And the minus epsilon is just the Feynman prescription for the Feynman propagator. And you have to have a superposition of free Feynman propagators with some weighting which is called the spectral density, which is positive. And that comes from unitarity. So unitarity tells us that the weighting here in that uh, composition is, is positive. Now, the reason why this is the answer is because we know the free Feynman propagator vanishes if you look at its uh, imaginary parts, which picks out the commutator. So we know that we know the free, commutator of free fields vanish inside the light cone. So if you take any superposition of free field commutators, it'll also vanish outside the light cone. So that, that then it automatically respects locality. And unitarity is just the statement that this quantity is positive. So that, that's the rough idea. And again, this is something that you know, was proven in the 1950s, if not 1940s, I forget now. Anyway, it's certainly well used in the 1950s. Um, now there's a couple of minor points I should emphasize. So typically, that superposition, we separate out a pole part, which is, if we're describing, you know, if you've got some scalar theory describing a massive particle, you'll expect a pole in the propagator signifying that particle with a possible wave function normalization. That's the normal thing. And usually the, the, this, this part, the continuum part, comes from the loop contributions. Um, if you're working at tree level, there's no continuum, it's only some of poles. Um, now, there's some minor subtlety, which I, I, I should go into, which is in the foot, for example, if you look in Weinberg, it's in the footnote, which is if the spectral density, uh, the, in general, if I, if I put n equals zero in here, so if I didn't have this mu to the n here, which is the naive expression that's derived in most field theory books, this integral doesn't necessarily converge because in practice, mu, rho of mu, typically grows like a polynomial at large values of mu. And so because of that growth, that polynomial growth, you have to perform a not what's called historically was called a number of subtractions, but in modern languages, composite operator normalizations. Um, and that amounts to, uh, in practice, it amounts to putting in a mu to the n on the bottom, compensated by a k to the n, and shifting out the potentially divergent contributions into a local polynomial, uh, which historically we call the subtraction constants. So the, the coefficients in that polynomial in k squared are called the subtraction constants. These are basically composite operator normalizations. And we're allowed to do this because, these, because this is a polynomial in k squared, it's local operators. So it's, it's box and box squared on a delta function, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so apart from that minor subtlety, the subtractions, um, that's, the, that's the, the general result, which is valid for any scalar operator in the Rense invariant vacuum. Now, as was recognized again already back in the 1950s, what well, all this amounts to a statement about the analytic structure of the two-point function. Because if we think, uh, if we take the I epsilon in the Feynman propagator and we just view that as basically a complexification of the momenta, so we define a complex momenta um, squared, um, then, and then now just make go to the whole complex plane for that variable, then what, this, what the challenge name presentation is doing is telling you that the, the, the full interacting Feynman propagator written in momentum space 
is an analytic function except for the pole, which describes the actual particle that you're looking at, and then a continuum of poles, aka, AKA a branch cut. So, and that branch cut, in, at least in perturbation theory, starts at 4m squared and goes out to infinity. And the subtraction constants, they're, of course, they're polynomial, so they are analytic themselves, and they just reflect the fact that um, the, the, propagate, the propagator itself doesn't necessarily uh, go to zero at infinity, and so you have to perform some number of subtractions when you do that. Uh, and this expression then, once just be declaring that analyticity story, this expression just follows from Cauchy's theorem. So if you do a contour and I say, oh, I want to know what the propagator is here, and I say it's analytic everywhere here, then I can do a contour which goes all the way around the branch cut, round at infinity, uh, all the way around back here and, and go on, uh, at least provided I take out a little contour around the pole, the pole piece. So there's a contour I can take, which determines the propagator at every point uh, as a, an integral along that contour. And the integral along that contour is essentially up to the, assuming the contribution at infinity drops, uh, which has to do with the subtraction constant, it's that integral is mainly dominated by the integral around the branch cut, once you've subtracted the pole piece out, and that, that is that integral. So this just follows from Cauchy's theorem. And the discontinuity across the branch cut is determined by the spectral density, and that discontinuity has to be positive by unitarity. And so that's the key result. Uh, so we'll see all this again later, but uh, the point I'm stressing is that all, all this key idea is already included in the two-point function in a very familiar uh, setting. Now, um, now let's think in modern terms and think in the language of effective field theory and what, what we know about this. So let's suppose um, we do know the low energy effective theory, but we don't know the UV completion physical scenario. And what that, the consequence of that is the fact that we know the low energy effective theory means that we should be able to calculate physics at energy scales below some scale lambda squared, well, lambda, sorry, lambda, which is the cutoff of the effective theory. But we don't know anything, we can't calculate above that. So we don't know what goes on above that because that's part of the unknown UV completion. Now, in terms of uh, analytic structure, then that basically tells us that we can calculate uh, a function which will have all the desired analyticity, which is valid in a regime of convergence uh, in this region inside the where the effective field theory is valid at energies below lambda squared. That will include uh, the pole, the pole sits within the low energy effective theory, as long as M is less than lambda squared. So we can compute that within the low energy effective theory. And it will compute, include the low energy part of the branch cut. So I don't know the high energy part of the branch cut because I would need to know the UV completion for that. I don't know that, but I can compute the low energy part of the branch cut in the low energy effective theory. So then what you can do is use that knowledge uh, and plug it back in and basically move where the branch cut is by taking the original two-point function, subtracting the known pole and subtracting the known low energy branch cut. And that will give a new analytic function whose analytic structure now is entirely the branch cut starting at lambda squared. And therefore it has a dispersion relation um, looking like this. So the consequence of that is that because um, we got rid of the pole, we subtracted the pole and we've moved the low energy branch cut, we've, we've placed the where this integral starts now is not at 4m squared, which is a low scale. We've pushed it up to the cutoff. Now, again, we don't know what rho of mu is above lambda squared. That is part of the UV completion. The whole point is if we're working from bottom up, we don't know what that is. But we do know that rho of mu is positive. And that's where the positivity bounds come in. Just from the knowledge that rho of mu as a function is positive, allows us to make statements about this pole subtracted uh, two-point function, um, even though we don't know what the UV completion is. Uh, in particular, if you just take this function, this analytic function now with the pole and the low energy cut removed, what I call the improved version of the amplitude, um, if you just expand it in powers of Z, it is an analytic function in a big region. If you expand that in powers of Z, as I'm allowed to, because it's an analytic function, every coefficient in that expansion is positive because it's an integral 
of the spectral density, which is positive, and then with a positive weight. So that's the, these, are, these are what you call the linear positivity bounds, uh, which is more or less the positive bounds people have been thinking about till relatively recently. Um, so, all the, so in the Taylor expansion, the propagator, all the coefficients are positive. You can say a bit more than that. Not only are they positive, they satisfy real relations amongst each other. So for example, if we increase the value of m by one, it puts one more power of mu on the bottom. And mu has to start at least at lambda squared. So therefore it's clear that dm is bigger than lambda squared times dm plus one, which means that uh, there's a hierarchy amongst the coefficients in the Taylor expansion, increasing by um, increasing every m by one up to a factor of lambda squared has to mean the coefficient gets smaller. That's, that's an important consequence as well. So all those are what I would call the lin positivity bounds, which is by and large what people have been doing till recently. Um, however, the newish excitement um, has come from the recognition there are also nonlinear positivity bounds, which again, in retrospect, it's absolutely obvious that they were there all along, um, but for some reason, you know, no one sort of put it together. Uh, and that was really recognized in this um, EFT hedron story, which is the, the new point. Uh, and the point there is really that, you know, once you, again, you can see it all here, once you see these integrals, I could view these integrals as uh, moments or expectation values. So if think of rho of mu like a probability density, then this, uh, well, rho of mu of a mu, I think I wrote it like here, this is, this is then a, a vacuum expectation or, <laughs> That's exaggerating. It's just a, it's just the average. It's the average with respect to probability density, and then we know, of course, averages satisfy you know Cauchy-Schwarz inequalities. Uh, so, for example, the variance is positive. The average of something squared is bigger than the average of the thing squared. Uh, and so, just as a simple consequence of Cauchy-Schwarz, you can easily show, for example, that the uh, Taylor coefficient uh, for two m times that for two n is bigger than n plus m squared. It's just an example, it just follows from Cauchy-Schwarz. Um, the EFT hedron people uh, phrase this in a sort of nice-ish way in, in a, as a determinant. So the, if you wrote a matrix out with these coefficients, or if you wrote a big matrix out and you just focused on the two by two part of that, we have d2n, d2m, dn plus n, dn plus m, um, this is just the statement. The determinant of that is positive. So this is this. So this is. In, they phrase this as the language of the positivity of a two D Hankel matrix. Uh, but it's just Cauchy-Schwarz. There's nothing. There's nothing miraculous going on here. It's just a simple consequence of that positivity of that spectral density. So, for example, repeated use of this inequality, you could show. You can put a bound on every coefficient d two n in terms of the ratio of d1 and d0 to appropriate power. So the, that once you've set an initial hierarchy between d1 and d0, that puts a non-trivial constraint on, on the hierarchy for all the remaining coefficients. And there's all sorts of statements you can make that follow from that. So th this is sort of the general idea. Um, I think I've got a question now. I don't know if you take questions in the middle normally. To, but... Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, uh, you can take questions. Yeah. Yeah, hi Andrew, this is Alok. So uh, one, one question I had was that the DM zero that you defined. Yeah. Uh, so that would be UV convergent only for M uh, bounded by N that you had defined earlier, right? Or did I? Uh... Yeah, that, that's right. So I'm not dwelling, I'm just, this is just sort of intro. So I'm not dwelling too much on that. So let's assume there were no subtractions. In okay, okay. Case, you know. Thanks. You're right. I can only apply these bounds for, um, Greater than the number of subtractions. I was sorry, I was a little bit quick on that. But, thank, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. You're, you're absolutely right. Okay. So again, just just to sort of illustrate this, and this is more for pedagogy than than anything. Let's suppose uh, in your low energy vector theory, as you integrate out, where you generate all sorts of high derivative operators. So let's just focus at tree level on that well, effective theory, and compute the propagator you get at tree level. Now, um, in general. Um, you will get high derivatives. So for example, th things like box and box squared and box cube. Usually we say, oh, I can remove those with field redefinitions. That's true when you compute the S matrix, but it's not true for correlation functions. Correlation functions change under field redefinitions. And so it changes the consequence. So if I remove these box squared, box cube with a field redefinition, which I can for the S matrix, 
um, it would change what the low energy field is relative to the high energy one. So let's suppose that and ask what the implications would be. Already just computing at tree level, the Feynman propagator in momentous space, well, box is minus k squared, k minus k squared is what I've called z, is the complex variable z. So then the tree level propagator you compute is this, one over this junk here. Um, and this has a pole, which is at z equals zero. So I, I haven't moved the pole. So then what I do is I subtract the pole and then I can tailor expand the remainder with what I call G prime, the improved thing, the pole subtracted two point function. And the, our previous positivity bound is the statement that all, all the coefficients in this expansion are positive. Uh, so we, so our li the linear positivity bounds are that so a1 is big bigger than zero, a2 is bigger than a1 squared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all these statements that you can derive, uh, and 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 that of course is then telling us about the original bounds on the coefficients in the original Wilson effective action. I've got, I've got another question. Do you want to just go quickly? Hi, Hello. Uh, so yeah. the so, so the inequality you derive in D. You're assuming only the positivity of rho mu or any special form of rho? Just the positivity, that's all, nothing else. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I guess the, the, the integral yeah. converges, so that relates to the subtractions, but beyond that, yeah, yeah. nothing else. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. <laughs> okay, so we can derive, you know, infinite number of statements if you, if you go, although to be, to be honest, the first few are the only the useful ones. Uh, so that was the linear bounds. We've also got the nonlinear bounds. The so nonlinear bounds, for example, one of the nonlinear bounds um, is that d2, d0 is bigger than d1. That's actually just the variance being positive. Uh, and so that means that this coefficient times this coefficient is bigger than this coefficient squared. If you rearrange that, it gets a nice little relation. a1, a3 is bigger than a2 squared. You can combine that with the previous linear bound if you want to and derive another relation, a4, a1 squared, bigger than a2 cubed, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all sorts of things you could derive. So whether they're useful or not, of course, depends on context, but um, we have a huge number of positivity bounds that we can infer already just at the level of, of two-point functions. Okay, so if you got that idea, you base that's that's the story, right? So the the the, the rest is just um, minor uh, extension to the fact to doing that for the S matrix. But there's nothing really new beyond from what we've we, was nothing too much new beyond what we've just said. So most of this discussion is applied to the S matrix. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the S matrix is invariant under field redefinitions, so it allows us to avoid the ambiguity of knowing how do I know that in my given effective field theory, I'm working with the field variables in the right form? Uh, how do I know I'm not just working in a funny field frame? The S matrix doesn't care. And the other thing is in the S matrix, we know the number of subtractions. Uh, and that is because if because of the Fasor bound. So as long as we know that something like the Fasor bound is true, that tells us the number of subtractions in this best relation. So the full uh, 1960s S matrix uh, law, of course, is that the S matrix should be unitary because it's just the uh, unitary operator that maps in and out states. Uh, locality tells you there's some bound on the growth of scattering amplitudes of complex momenta. Historically, it was assumed polynomially bounded, but really only need a linear exponential bound. That bound is just so that the, you can Fourier transform back to real space. It's that, it's that simple. Um, Causality is historically argued to be related to analyticity. Um, that derivation is, is not quite as rigorous as people like to think. It is in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but in relativistic theory, it's, it's a little bit more murky, but basically we assume that analyticity captures uh, causality. Um, Poincaré invariance is an obvious one. And then of course we have crossing symmetry when we start talking about scattering amplitudes. Now, in particular, when we look at an amplitude like A plus B goes to C plus D, um, and that's called the S-channel process, because of the uh, its main, the incoming momenta is, is determined by the S-Mandelstam variable under SU crossing symmetry, which is where we switch two and four so that the amplitude becomes A plus D bar goes to C plus B bar. The scattering amplitude is supposed to respect some invariance under crossing symmetry. 
Um, and then the last crucial assumption of the 1960s is because they were at the time they were only thinking about massive particles when they were doing these calculations. And so there was an assumption that there was a mass gap. Everybody was massive, essentially. Um, and uh, that leads then to the fast bound. Now, I'll come back. If I've got time, I'll come back a little bit later to how that gets messed up in the case of masses theories, like with gravity. But we'll assume that for now. OK. Now, um, the consequence of all that, after a, long, a longer story, uh, but it's more or less the same idea, just as in the Chalon Lehmann spectral representation, you can prove that the scattering amplitude as a function of Mandelstam variables, complex Mandelstam variable S at fixed real T, small real T, uh, is an analytic function, modulo poles and branch cuts in the, determined by the physics. So you have, just as in the challenge Lehman, you have the pole at m squared and you have the branch cut going to the right. The new feature is because of crossing symmetry, under SU crossing symmetry, because U is 4m squared minus S minus T, you then have a crossing symmetric related pole, because if S is m squared, you get 3m squared minus T, you have a crossing symmetric related pole and a crossing symmetric, symmetric related branch cut. And for fixed T, that's all, all you have if you're looking in that slice, uh, the full Mandelstam uh, variables. Um, if, you, if you vary T and S, there's a more complicated structure. And so Mandelstam, for example, wrote down this double spectral representation and it's all sorts of complicated. Uh, but it, but the, the most, most of the discussion is just for a fixed slice, a fixed real T, the analytic structure at complex um, S. Uh, and the punchline is because the facile bound tells you that the scattering amplitude doesn't grow faster than S squared, you can write a dispersion relation with only two subtractions, just, uh, but otherwise it's the same principle as before. You have an integral around the right-hand cut, this one, integral around the left-hand cut. You have the pole pieces and you have some subtraction functions. Now it's functions of T. Um, but the key thing is unitarity is still in play and unitarity tells you that the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude is positive at t is zero. And it also tells you it's positive um, for positive t. Uh, and that follows it from the individual positivity of each individual partial wave, because I can write this in terms of partial waves. And so for, for positive t, small positive t, because by small I mean less than 4m squared, the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude is also positive. Uh, and so we can run the same arguments. Right. The, the only new the new thing is this extra branch cut from the left. It's slightly complicated thing, uh, but we can run the same arguments. In particular, we can remove we can run the same compute the improved scattering amplitude, which is where you take subtract the low energy pole and the low energy branch cut, remove it, shift it out to lambda squared. So now the branch cut starts at, at lambda squared. Um, uh, and so just in the forward limit setting t equals zero, the Mandelstam variable t equals zero, you can then do the same thing. You tailor expand the scattering amplitude in powers of s. Because of the number of subtractions, you can't say anything about the first two coefficients or really the first coefficient in the Taylor expansion, the constant piece, uh, but you can about all the other pieces. And the statement is that all the coefficients in the Taylor expansion, they themselves are given by integrals over a positive weight, a positive spectral density. The spectral density is determined by some of the S-channel branch cut imaginary part and the U-channel imaginary part, but both of those are positive by unitarity. So each of those coefficients are positive. Um, and that that basically, that bound, that forward limit bound is what was used in the, the sort of well-known Adams et al. paper that sort of uh, reinvigorated this uh, back in 2006. And indeed, in that particular paper, they, 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 the classic example that they pointed out was, let's suppose I think about sort of a Goldstone-like effective theory, where I have a scalar with a shift symmetry, who's, which has an interaction defined to the four. Uh, and then you can show that the, the first non-trivial term in the Taylor expansion of the scattering amplitude, the thing that comes from the S squared plus T squared plus U squared piece, um, that is determined by this coefficient. Um, so that coefficient has to be positive. In fact, it's better than that. That coefficient has to be bigger than its loop contribution. So when you do the improved bounds, you can also compute the loop from the light 
part of that and subtract that out. So not only is the coefficient C positive, it has to be bigger than something proportional to itself squared, which is the, its own light loop contribution. And uh, the point, what they pointed out in the Adams Elfral paper is this is what you would have expected based on causality considerations, because you can show it have a coefficient like this. If you look at typical propagation of fluctuations around background solutions, if C is negative, um, you get superluminality. Uh, if C is positive, you get subluminality. So it appears to be there's a connection between the positivity bound and causality. And you would expect that because causality was one of the assumptions in the derivation of the positivity bounds. It's in the analytic structure. And indeed, uh, you can show in, in any kind of explicit UV completion of this model that if C is negative, usually some other problem. So you can write down UV completions and show that when C is negative, you either get a ghost or a tachyon. So there's a, the, you, can, you can see that it really, it really works out like that in explicit examples. Uh, a few years ago, we generalized this a little bit more away from forward limit positivity. Um, I, I won't dwell too much on that. So for example, we applied this to Galilean theories with a mass term, uh, which you can see um, the application of positivity bounds away from the forward limit also strongly constrains, but does not rule out those effective theories. Although I will rule it out in a bit. <laughs> so we'll move on. Uh, from that. And we were also able to generalize um, these positivity bounds straightforwardly to general spin scattering using something called the transversity formalism in which the real crossing relation is, is, is simple. So because I don't have a lot of time left, I'm going to skip over that and sort of get to some of the applications. So in fact, what got me into this was from thinking about interacting massive spin two theories such as massive gravity and how uh, positivity constraints put constraints on on those and in particular what we were looking at is uh, massive gravity theories where you take einstein hilbert action and then you break the diff symmetry by adding a mass term um and uh, that's a that's a whether or not that's a legitimate effective theory is we have to ask the question and does it does it violate something does it violate causality something like that and so what we did is, uh, uh, well, what various people have been doing, in fact, is thinking about, does it violate the positivity bounds? Now, rather interestingly, the so-called ghost-free um, massive gravity theories um, don't, they don't immediately violate the forward limit positivity bounds, the ones that are uh, used in the Adams et al. paper, but they do, the positivity bounds do strongly constrain the parameter space. It turns out there's only, there's a nice paper by Chen and Raymond back in 2016, in which they pointed out that for the two main two coefficients that determine the mass term in the so-called ghost-free mass of gravity, the, um, there was a, only a very small island of allowed regions. So positive bounds would turn out to be very powerful at constraining the effective theory for interacting spin two theories. That was just from forward limit. Since then, we've realized that if you go beyond the forward limit, um, you can show, if you take more general effective theories for massive spin two, uh, there's a more general class of theories, which we usually call lambda five theories, where the cutoff is even lower, that the positive bounds actually constrain set to zero, effectively set to zero all sorts of coefficients, such that the cutoff is raised from lambda two to lambda three, um, where well, lambda three is the cube root of m squared m Planck, which is exactly the cutoff scale in the so-called ghost-free massive gravity theories. Uh, so it turns out that in the context of these theories, the, the positive bounds are really very powerful at, at, at constraining the theories, but so far not completely ruled out. They're, they're very constrained, but they're not completely ruled out by the positivity bounds that we've um, looked at. Um, and we've done that for multiple spin two theories, but I'll skip over that because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So more recent progress though, as I've already mentioned, is that people are now recognizing that we also have nonlinear positivity bounds. And we can also make more use of a full crossing symmetry. And in particular, uh, Aninda has been uh, worked on this as a couple of papers um, uh, recently, making use of the full crossing symmetry on the uh, scattering amplitude. Uh, and I'll just sort of briefly sketch how that works out. Uh, so 
roughly speaking, the idea here is. Um, sorry, can yes. you? Yes. I had I had raised my hand. Oh, so sorry, I didn't see you. It, it's right. okay. Uh, before you go on, because now you're changing gears. So can we go back to the massive gravity for a second? Uh, yes, if you want to, yeah. Yeah, the last slide on your massive gravity that you showed us. Yes, this yeah. one. So, yeah, uh, so I, I'm just curious. I mean, <clears throat> is the general lesson I should take from this is that the once you extend it to the non-zero T that is away from forward direction, the positivity bounds are really very, very constraining for. Uh, the yeah, they're already. They're, there is. They're but, already. Right. Sorry. Yeah, go, go on. No, so I just wanted to see whether sort of one has to take a lesson from this that the massive gravity theories as we see them and as when everyone has been trying seem to be less and less likely to be, you know, implemented as a, implementable as a field theory or. Yeah, so it, they, they're more and more, that's right. There's a, what we're seeing as we go further in the positivity bounds that the, the region, allowed region of parameter space for massive gravity theories for which could, could have this sort of standard type of UV completion is getting smaller and smaller. So the consistency itself, it is basically the constraint coming from the consistency of the theory itself. Yes, is although it comes- enough? Yes, that's, that's right, that's right. Okay. Although I mean, this is you know, a there's an assumption in yeah. yeah. Yeah, the assumption is about, as you correctly said, Lorentz invariance and so on and so forth. Exactly, exactly. And locality yeah. in particular. Okay. Locality. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we can Sorry come back. You in the no, that's okay. Yeah, so. so uh, Andrew, but, but this could also be pointing at a unique unique massive gravity theory that does not necessarily. Well, that, that's right. You, you could, you could uh, I mean, you know, it, there's not necessarily a negative thing, right? Because. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, in the spirit of like sort of bootstrappy or so, where it's saying, you know, if, if this conclusion is there's only one allowed value, then that's great. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Okay. okay. But except that the consistency, whatever one wants to say, the in the theory space, the region where things are consistent has been has shrunk considerably because of the this extension of the positivity bounds away yes, from this, this is absolutely true yes that is the only sort of one lesson i can take away from your discussions that's right okay. that's right okay thanks that is indeed my conclusion of that part <laughs> okay so um yeah so to give you a bit more of the newer stuff then so what people now using so this is just the partial wave expansion in d dimensions in four dimensions, it's in terms of Legendre polynomials, in D dimensions, in terms of Gegenbauer polynomials. Um, and if you run the same arguments, the, we know the scattering amplitude, it has a dispersion relation. Once you subtract off the pole part, it'll have a dispersion relation. Um, but now we, if we look more closely at what that imaginary part is, the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude, we can track it down as a sum over individual imaginary parts of each individual partial wave. So uh, let's let's actually then, and that's useful because we know we actually know the T dependence from individual partial waves is determined by these so-called Gegenbauer polynomials or Legendre polynomials in 4D. So that tells us something more about the T dependence than we used before. So used before we just use the overall positivity of the imaginary part of the amplitude for general T, but now we can use more information from the individual partial waves. Uh, and this is useful because now we can think um, our spectral density now is not just a function of mu, but it's also a function of individual partial wave. And we our average now we can view as an average over all the mu's and over all the partial waves. Now, just as before, the various coefficients in the Taylor expansion of the scattering amplitude can be viewed as moments with respect to these particular averages. But what we're extending from before is now our average includes a sum over partial partial waves. I can see another question. But I'm going to go go keep going so that I, I make at least partially make it through. Uh, so in particular, the this coefficient f here, which is basically the s derivatives of the scattering amplitude, pulse effect scattering amplitude, are all given by moments and therefore all positive because they're averages with respect to positive spectral density, which is determined by the imaginary part of each partial wave. Now, one of, so one of the new things is that people now recognize, well, now I can feed back full crossing symmetry 
because all, so far I've only used SU crossing symmetry. The dispersion relation, the fixed T dispersion relation is ST crossing symmetric. Sorry, it's SU crossing symmetric, but it's not manifestly ST crossing symmetric. So let's now feed that information uh, back in. Well, if there's a regime in which both the SU and the ST dispersion relations are valid, and historically that is the so-called Mandelson triangle in which both formulas should be trusted, then I can equate the SU dispersion relation, the fixed D dispersion relation with a fixed S dispersion relation. And those two things should be equal. That is a non-trivial relation. That is not automatically satisfied by anything we've assumed so far. In particular, it leads to uh, non-trivial constraints, which um, uh, this paper by um, Simon called null constraints, I'm gonna use that terminology, which just come from the fact that, you know, for, so for example, if we're just, just a single scalar for which it's the same scalar in, going in, in and out, so that it should be maximally crossing symmetric, then the scattering amplitude as a function of st should be the same as that as a function of t and s, that's crossing symmetry. And so we can just take the difference and expand that in powers of s and t and say, well, that has to be true order by order in expansion. And we learn non-trivial constraints on the partial wave coefficients, um, uh, the averages of partial wave coefficients, I should say. So in particular, this average of this quartic polynomial in, in the partial waves divided by mu squared, that has to be zero by full crossing symmetry. This does not follow from unitarity. It does not follow from the dispersion relation as we've written it up to now. It follows from full cross symmetry. Okay, so it's a new input. So now the new thing is we can say, well, can I can take this new input and feed it back into the positivity bounds. So for example, let me focus on uh, this particular ratio uh, what I'm defining here is F01, F00. The, the F01 is the coefficient of the cubic, the STU part in the Mandelstam ex expansion. So cubic in Mandelstam variables and the F00 is the coefficient of the quadratic part, the S squared plus T squared plus U squared. So, if I, so it's just basically the, you know, one is the 2S, one T derivative of the amplitude, the other is the 2S derivative, okay? I can, from the partial wave expansion, you can derive an exact statement that the ratio of these two plus this particular average is equal to this particular average. So what? Not particularly exciting. Well, now let's use, for example, Cauchy Schwartz, these nonlinear bounds that come from Cauchy Schwartz, for which we know that the average of x squared is less than the average of x squared. So if we square that quantity, this is that squared. And by Cauchy Schwartz, that's less than this thing squared. But this this uh, square of this quadratic polynomial, which is a quartic polynomial, well, well, then you can use the crossing symmetry, which was also a statement about a quartic polynomial, to essentially kill off the, the quartic pieces, because in fact, the, this quadratic polynomial squared equals another quadratic polynomial plus exactly that thing, which is set to zero by full crossing symmetry. So because of that, you can then uh, derive a bound that this quantity squared is less than a particular average of a quadratic polynomial in L. And that quadratic polynomial L, in fact, after a little rearranging is exactly this combination again. And therefore we get something squared is less than itself uh, and rearrange that, that puts an upper and a lower bound on that coefficient, which is very tight. So what we find is that the F01 is bounded from above and below by something of the same order. Uh, now, F01, to remind you, is the coefficient of the uh, cubic part of the amplitude expanded in Mandelstam variables, and the F00 is the quadratic. Uh, so that has a big implication, because what it means is that in practice, if F00 is small, then F01 is small, right? Because it's bounded by, by that. And that basically rules out a class of uh, low energy effective theories, which have particularly soft behavior for their scattering amplitudes, of which the most well-known is the so-called uh, Galilean theories. Um, so Galilean theories are theories which have an extra uh, uh, non-linearized symmetry, as well as a shift symmetry, pi goes to pi plus a constant. You can shift pi by something uh, V mu X mu, so something such that the derivative of pi shifts by a constant and the action is left invariant. 
Now, even if you break that symmetry, even if you break it, for example, you could break it with a mass term or you could break it with an explicit d pi to the four term. Even if you break that symmetry, as long as that breaking is only weak, then it is the case that because of the symmetry, the consequence of the symmetry is that the scattering amplitude has soft behavior such that the coefficient of the, what I'm calling the X term, the quadratic Mandelstam combination, S squared plus T squared plus U squared, versus the coefficient of the cubic one, the Y I was calling Y here, the STU, this thing is suppressed relative to that. So there's an additional suppression, which is of order, say the mass, if the mass is the thing breaking, the suppression is of order m squared of a lambda three squared. Lambda three is just the scalar. The cut basic is the cut of the effective theory. So uh, Galilean symmetry basically says this thing is small, is suppressed relative to the scale of this term or this term. But this positivity bound tells you that's not possible because this thing, which is the coefficient of the y here, is bounded above and below precisely by this coefficient. Therefore, this thing can't be suppressed without this thing also being suppressed. But then if this is also suppressed, this is not smaller than this, in which case you don't have the Galilean symmetry running around. So the new pos these new extended positivity bounds, which make use of full crossing symmetry, basically rule out even whole classes of effective field theories, which were naively would be okay or write down and say, I've got effective theory, I'll demand this symmetry, blah, 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 even if it's mildly broken it rules it out, so it puts strong constraints on those, those kinds of theories. Um, now, I, I know I don't have a lot of time left. How, how, long, how long have I got? Probably five minutes, right? No, you, you have 10 minutes. We started uh, five minutes past. Okay, 10 minutes. Okay, so, so, the, so, uh, so that, that, I mean, that's really the main point about that, and then various people have extended um, those discussions. Um, now, a, so the final point I just want to touch on, and because of time, I don't have a lot to say about this, but what, what happens when you couple to gravity? So, so far, the bounds that I've looked at are bounds derived in the context of field theory or where you have an S matrix with a mass gap. Now, when you get, when you couple to gravity, it's a little bit more subtle because the graviton is massless. Well, that, that so, so what? I could have a massless scalar. Well, the other issue is that um, not only is the graviton massless, it's T channel, it gives a T channel pole, it gives a contribution from T channel exchange, which has a pole whose residue grows like S squared. So basically the amplitude looks like S squared over T, but S squared is grows faster than allowed by the fuss or bound. Now, so the implication of that is that, um, well, there's a couple of things. One is that uh, because of the pole, you can't analytically continue the partial wave expansion from T less than zero to T bigger than zero necessary to derive the dispersion relations, point one. And the second point is that even if you could, even if you trusted that, the positive, small positive T, the Foissel bound can't be true anymore because the T-channel pole part of it already violates the, the Foissel. So that sort of undermines that. So, um, so up to now, we've had a little bit of trouble applying positivity bounds it, coupled to gravity. Uh, nevertheless, despite this, what some people have been doing is saying, well, there's some arguments in the literature that says maybe the positivity applies to the scattering amplitude in which you just subtract out the T-channel pole. Uh, so we thought, well, let's, let's just see what happens in actual interesting cases. Uh, for example, QED. You can take QED, which is a renormalizable theory. Okay, technically it has a lambda pole and so on, but that's, you know, that's not really a big deal. Uh, just couple that to gravity. Okay, when you couple a renormalizable theory to gravity, it becomes an effective theory because gravity is non-renormalizable. So then that propagates through. It is an effective theory. However, you still expect the cutoff of that theory to have something to do with the Planck scale, right? Because you only made it non-renormalizable by coupling to gravity. So clearly the cutoff should go to infinity as M Planck goes to infinity. I mean, in most optimistically, if you couple a renormalizable theory to gravity, you'd think the cutoff would just be M Planck most optimistically. Uh, well, let's see what happens. Uh, well, there's actually a long, interesting story um, about even QED coupled to gravity, which relates to this. So as I remember that earlier we said the positivity bound something to do with lack of superluminality. Well, interesting result go going back to Drummond and Hath Hathrell is if you naively take QED coupled to gravity and you look at the low energy effective theory, that low energy effective theory actually emits mildly superluminal propagation. Does that mean it's ruled out? 
it's not entirely uh, clear. Um, it's not because you know, it's 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 very small. It's a very small thing, so it's not clear it's even there's a genuine causality violation. So let's think about that. So the situation we're imagining is we have our our effective theory is QED coupled to gravity. So I'll call it gravitational QED. Um, now, so it's real QED. It's got an electron. If you integrate out the electron, you could, you've got another lower, even lower energy effective field theory, which is the Euler-Heisenberg effective theory, coupled to gravity. Most of the positivity discussions that people have done are in the context of the Euler-Heisenberg theory. Um, uh, but they don't need to be. You can do it. Uh, so depending on which effective, which level of effective field theory you can do, you can get different positivity bounds. But as you go up, obviously, you're going to get better statements. So we'll assume that there is some unknown UV completion for QED coupled to gravity, uh, which kicks in at some cutoff. I don't know what that cutoff is. Uh, optimistically, it's M Planck. It may be below that. Um, it's at some scale between the electron mass and the M, M Planck. Well, uh, if we take QED and we integrate out the electron, then we get the so-called Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian, which includes, as well as Maxwell, You've got an F squared, an FF tilde squared, um, uh, and then curvature couplings, curvature F squared, et cetera, Riemann's, Rigi squared, and so on. Uh, if you're just computing the S matrix, most of these operators can be removed with a field redefinition. So, for example, Ricci and, uh, sorry, Riemann, yeah, Ricci and Ricci scalar can be removed with a field redefinition from the Einstein Hilbert term. And you can reduce that always down. The unique operators that come in at leading order are just the F, F squared squared, the F to the four, the FF tilde squared, and FF vial tensor. Obviously it's vial because Ricci and Ricci scalar and Ricci curvature can be removed with field redefinitions of the metric. And that, there's three coefficients there. So there's basically three non-trivial coefficients that contribute to the scattering amplitude in the leading order contribution to the scattering amplitude in the Euler-Heisberg theory. Now, people are very interested is, do positivity blinds apply to these coefficients? Because there are some arguments in the literature that if they did, that would prove the weak gravity conjecture. And the reason is if, 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 if a particular relation, if a particular positivity relation happened for uh, one combination of the coefficients, then you can argue that then in that case, because, because this effective theory has F, F, F to the four interactions and so on, the solution for an extremal black hole, a charged black hole, is modified. It is not the, the normal one. And it can be modified in a way that the charge to mass ratio can be bigger than one or less than one, depending on the sign of the bounds. So if positivity bounds implied positivity of a particular combination of the coefficients in this Lagrangian, you can show that then the extremal black holes always have charge to mass ratio bigger than one, uh, furthermore, that charge to mass ratio gets bigger the smaller the mass of the black hole. And this then basically resolves the original arguments for the weak gravity conjecture, because now there is a, a route by which black holes, charged black holes can decay. They can decay into smaller black holes with a larger uh, charge to mass ratio. Um, so that's one argument. So it would be nice to know if the positivity bounds apply here. Um, and most of the discussion of that, as I say, is applied in the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrange. There's also another nice argument by Chung and Raymond, which is that said, if you just assume positivity bounds are true for the T-channel pole subtracted scattering amplitude, so I compute the four photon, photon, photon goes to photon, photon amplitude, you get the gravity pole plus something. If, if you argue this is positive, which is what would normally be the case, demanding that's positive for real QED coupled to gravity, simply demands that the charge to mass ratio is bigger than one over M Planck, which looks like the weak gravity conjecture as well. So it seems to be there's some connection between weak gravity conjecture and the positivity bounds. Very, very tempting, very tempting to, to, to see that, but not exactly uh, rigorous. Well, this isn't quite true though. Uh, and the reason is that the reason, the way this is managing to be positive, this combination, for real QED, obviously the charge to mass ratio is bigger than one over M Planck. Um, but the way this is being positive is it's coming from a known electron loop contribution. Okay, when you when you go down from QED to Euler-Heisenberg, you integrate out the electron, so you've got the electron loop. But the electron loop is a known thing. Why did you apply the positive bounds in the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian? Why didn't you just apply them in QED? 
So if you then run the positive feed bounds in QED themselves, and you do the improved bounds where you take find the pole and remove the low energy branch cut, uh, which you can do. So you explicitly take the amplitude, subtract off the pole, remove the cut out to a higher energy scale. Uh, well, you can do that. You can compute the or up to order one in Planck squared, all the gravitational QED gra diagrams. So you have the normal electron loop. You have a graviton exchange, you have graviton exchange with an electron loop, uh, electron loops sticking on a vertex, et cetera, and the various relation, crossing relation to those. Then demanding positivity of the T-channel pole subtracted amplitude uh, gives this condition. So lambda now is the cutoff. It's the scale at which we assumed we can move the branch cut to. Okay, so it's the assumed cutoff of the effective theory. It turns out that the positivity is only true of the T-channel pulse spectrum amplitude is only true if the cutoff is below a very low scale, which is the charge times m times m Planck square root. This, this, and the reason this occurs is because the gravitational contribution of the positivity bounds is or basically always negative, characteristically negative. We did this for scalar theories; it's basically always negative. Not, I mean, not a theorem negative, but it's typically negative. Um, so that's kind of weird. So does that mean that QED coupled to gravity really does have a low energy, low cutoff? Or does it mean that the positivity bounds with massless gravity don't quite apply? Well, um, there is another explanation, which is that maybe the positivity bounds don't apply as rig rigorous, rigidly, rigidly as we thought, and that a small amount of negativity is allowed coupled to gravity such that um, the thing that is normally classed to be positive can actually be slightly uh, negative. So in fact, in this paper where we did this for scalars, we already conjectured uh, that in the form for the scattering amplitude when you couple to gravity, that you have the T-channel pole and that thing that is normally declared to be positive in the usual bounds, the adams adult bounds, uh, we conjectured that when the presence of gravity, that could be ever so slightly negative as long as that negativity is suppressed by the Planck scale. Well, uh, in fact, there's been a recent um, nice paper uh, this, uh, by these authors, Shaw Boundaries for the Swampland, in which they found a route to, dis to extend the positivity bounds in the presence of massless gravity. And the way they do this is basically, instead of looking at fixed T, the normal thing doesn't work at, at fixed T is zero or positive T, they look at fixed impact parameter, which is actually negative t and then they have to do sort of very um uh they have to do take uh superpositions of bounds essentially to, to to take combinations which are positive in a slightly subtle way so that they can still run the bounds essentially of what are effectively negative values of t and what they find exactly in from their bounds in the case of four dimensions that quantity which is usually demanded to be positive could be ever so slightly negative um, and this is consistent, in fact, with the drummond hathnor result. The amount that you get superluminality in the low energy vector theory for QED is also suppressed in the same way. And so it seems to be that there is a, the, the story with the positivity bands when you couple to gravity is actually there's a small amount of negativity is allowed consistent with causality. And so that was my final punchline. So I know I've gone slightly over, but... Um, Basically, you know, just to sort of overview the, the main points is that then uh, some of the new things is that, you know, use of the nonlinear positivity bounds and full crossing symmetry, much more powerful. We're now getting upper and lower bounds on Wilson coefficients. Generally, these things are extremely powerful on, on um, interacting spin theories, which are, you know, things that were basically naturally very non-renormalizable, so effective Goldstone type effective theories. Um, we still not completely understood how to run all these arguments for massless gravity, uh, um, but there has been, as, as I say, there's been very recent progress on that, and it seems to be that some mild amount of negativity without contradicting unitarity and so on uh, is actually allowed in that, that context. Um, and the hope, I think, still the grand hope is that one can basically somehow prove weak gravity conjecture using positivity bounds, uh, although that isn't there at the moment. Uh, so, okay, so I should I should stop there. That's uh, a mute and clap for Andrew. Uh, 
And uh, questions? Uh... Uh, hi, Aninda, I, ha I have a yeah, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, actually, this uh, this is actually regarding the last uh, last point that you have written in the conclusion also that the ex ex extension to massless gravity. So uh, is it is it because of the fact that we don't have uh, full crossing symmetry if you don't have any mass cap in the theory? I mean, is that one of the obstructions in? No, um, it is uh, not. No, no, it's not cro crossing symmetry on the issue. It's simply that um, the, you know if you if you go back to the the proofs, the, where the partial wave expansion is valid is that is in the physical region. You start in the physical region, which is t less than zero. Yes. And the idea is then you try to continue that through over to t positive, and the yes. positivity applies at positive t, which is unphysical region. So you need to go from the physical to the unphysical. Yes. Yes. Now, normally that's okay. If the theory has a mass gap, yes. you can do that. You can get through T as zero yes. without hitting anything. But when the theory has a massless particle, yes, yes. then the, the branch cut, well. Yeah, yeah, it shuts zero, zero, so, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you can't do that, that's the problem. So, 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 but isn't that somehow related to also the fact that, I mean, that we don't really have a proof of crossing if your, our theory doesn't have a mass gap. I mean, all the proofs- Well, it's, it's um, connected, obviously, yeah, because yeah. Uh, if there's no mass gap, there's no- Yeah, know, yeah, 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 to yeah. Get around the, the contour. But um, I think that it's a less of an issue. That's more of a technical issue. I see. I Whereas this is more of a fundamental issue. So the, the fundamental issue is that is and it's really there for spin two. It's not there for scalars. Oh, massive scalars are not an issue. It's, it's massive spin two. And the reason is the residue of the T-channel pole goes like S squared. And S squared is bigger than mm. the Faso bound. So what that tells you is that um, as you go through T is zero, the, uh, the scattering amplitude, which went from being less than S squared, Yes, goes to being more than s squared, and that tracks actually to the red Reggie behavior in the imaginary part. Uh, it, it's basically because the, the the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude, which sits in the dispersion integral, it's it has a Reggie like behavior, and as you yes. cross that threshold, it grows as a faster power of mu, such that the uh, the normal two subtraction dispersion relation doesn't converge, uh -huh. and you have to go to a three subtraction uh -huh. dispersion relation as you go from T. So there is a three subtraction dispersion relation for gravity, mm -hmm. but there's not a two subtraction dispersion relation because of that fact. And that, so, so it tracked exactly to the Reggie behavior. I think, thanks. And, and, uh, and uh, is that, do, you, do, you, do you have any comment about the recent low spin dominance, um, uh, you know, I don't know, conjecture that Byrne and uh, others have put forward? Only, only that it's a long paper. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, no, I mean it looks it looks very interesting. I haven't I haven't I haven't really had time to to read it in too much uh, detail, but it looks very interesting. Um, that that's that's my only comment. <laughs> so, Anina, can I just ask one more? Uh, yeah. So, just the fact that this, uh, as you said, that for the scalar, it's not an issue. So, if you only if you don't have mass cap and you have scalars, then you are saying that these uh, bounds can be applied. But somehow, is the is the fact that we cannot prove crossing, that's not, uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, is that not a, uh, so the Galilean, Galilean ruling out Galilean theories bounds that you derived, I mean, uh, especially when you had broken the shift symmetry by the, you know, not by the mass term, but by the partial pi to the fourth term, I mean, yeah. the low energy. So is that, is that, is that, is the fact that crossing cannot be proved regressively? You, you think that's just a technical issue and that may not be a big. I, I uh, think so. Because obviously crossing is true in the low energy effective theory. Um, right, right, right. You, can't, you cannot not respect crossing in the low energy, whether, whether the masslessness doesn't make any difference. It's obviously crossing. For, basically, because for scalars, you can always add a mass and take view the massless as the limit of the massive. But okay, obviously, okay. yeah, yeah. And two, that's really mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, if you like, it's a little bit like VDVZ discontinuity, right? For, for, right. But for spin two and higher, you can't view the massless as the limit of the massive, but for spin yeah. one and spin zero, you can. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks, thanks, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? And Andrew, I can, uh, maybe I can ask you one. So uh, these two-sided bounds that you were talking about, uh, which you wanted to use to rule out various theories, uh, 
to definitely rule out uh, or rule in a particular theory, you require the strongest uh, two-sided bounds. How would you know that the that you've got the strongest two-sided bound? Yeah, I mean, the one I derived is not the strongest, yeah. but it didn't really matter for the argument I was making because um, if if what you're rolling out is a class of a theory where there's a symmetry that let that says there has to be a hierarchy, when there's a symmetry that says something is zero, right? Or even if you break that, then it says that that, that particular quantity has to be hierarchically suppressed yes. relative to something else. So then in fact, the order unity factors don't really matter. Right, right. So the... ruling out, I guess is fine, but ruling in uh, would require you to say that you've got the strongest two-sided bound. That's right, that's right. Um, I mean, but ruling in, I think, is never really um, a thing you can do because we, we never know that we've not, you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. This I'm this is a, a discovery process, right? So they they they. Yeah, there's a we we don't know that there's not even more bounds that we could get from doing something else. Um, that's true. But uh, yeah, so I mean. I mean, I, I haven't mentioned it, of course, but the, the standard model EFT people are you know, now seriously using this to put um, yes. Yes. theoretical priors on, on the uh, allowed dimension six and et cetera operators that you get in standard model effective field theories. Uh, and again, there, I think you don't, it doesn't need to be the strictest thing, right? It, already, if you've got some prior that it's, it has to be in this region, even if, it's actually in that region, it doesn't matter, right? Because already you've got, already it's a huge constraint yeah, that is true. relative to what you would have if you didn't yeah. have that prior. Yeah. Okay, uh, if there are, I don't see any further questions. Uh, so let's thank Andrew for a very, very nice talk. And uh, I guess we will put this up uh, or maybe, I mean, uh, we will have a YouTube channel. CHP has a YouTube channel, so we'll put it up at some point. Thank you. Thank you.